is about hospitality and about the um, English entertaining the French and the French entertaining the English. The English certainly thought the French entertained very well, so I was very pleased to be invited and to say thank you for inviting me. Um, Tales of Two Societies, the, that's, the title's a rip-off from uh, the most famous English novel about London and Paris, A Tale of Two Cities, which was published unfortunately in 1859. It doesn't seem to have had any influence on um, any of the events I'll be describing. Uh, let's, begin, let's begin with a banquet. Um, 1885, really important date. Um, the, uh, this was a banquet in London. It was a banquet to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the London Statistical Society, which happened to be the 20, I mean, it, it was a year late, um, but it happened to be the 25th anniversary of the um, Paris Society. Um, at the dinner in uh, London, uh, Emile Levasseur uh, gave a speech, and in the speech, he talked about the, the two societies, um, Paris society being like, well, actually, Paris society was young enough to be a daughter, but he didn't say it was a daughter. Uh, that, was too, a blunt, that would be a blunder. The two societies were certainly the same family, and each had the same object in view. I'll be talking about the nature of the family relationship and the nature of the, the object, because both of those changed in the period I'm looking at. Uh, the, the object uh, and the kind of people who pursued this object, well that changed because originally, both in London and then in Paris, and possibly, or perhaps I should say in Paris in, you know, and then in London, or, anyway, the original object was the accumulation of social facts. So this would be true for 1860. Um, 1885, the people pursuing this were, well, all sorts of people, uh, economists, politicians, public health experts, demographers, geographers. What they had in common was that they were, they were not professional statisticians, they were amateurs, enthusiasts, whatever. That was in 1860. By 1940, or well, perhaps only in, in 1940, you could see the beginning of a new kind of subject. This is a subject organized around probability and mathematical statistics, and the people who do it are trained uh, professionals. They're not the amateurs of, of 1860. So the object changed in this period I'll be looking at. Um, the family relationship changed. There basically wasn't very much of a family relationship in 1860. Uh, the British did British statistics, the French did French statistics, the Norwegians did Norwegian statistics. People respected uh, what the other people did. They, if they were interested in international comparisons, they read what the other people did. Uh, but they read, they didn't meet. Well, they met in international con congresses. And after 1885, in the uh, International Institute, and the International Institute had purposes rather like the um, uh, London and the Paris societies, uh, but had this international dimension uh, to impose or promote standardised categories and, and measures. So, uh, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, British statisticians might meet French statisticians if they met at all at these uh, meetings of the International Institute. By 1940, or in the last few years of the 1930s, there, was, there are a number of people in London and Paris who were interested in mathematical statistics, they corresponded on scientific matters, and they visited one another. So that's the change in the family relationship. Of course, you know, if you look at the original, pro if you look at the project now, and you think, what, mathematical statistics? You think, well, backcasting, the original, pro the original project may have, should have been applied probability. 
But it wasn't at all. Uh, it, that's a bit surprising in a way because the founding generation in London in the 1830s, uh, some of those people read Laplace, he's the person in technical, uh, they read Laplace, but it didn't actually feed in to uh, the uh, objects of the society. More remarkably, uh, Ketelet uh, was the godfather to the society, so he was actually a founding member of the society in London. But what he was interested in was in, he was interested in getting the numbers. He wasn't particularly interested, or he didn't promote <coughs> the project of uh, doing probabilistic things with the numbers. So that, those guys are retrospectively uh, ancestors, but not really ancestors in the way you think. Uh, the, oh, by the way, the London Society changed its name in 1884 to the Royal Statistical Society. This really was a pure name change. It, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't uh, a merger of any kind. It was just a name change. It was just um, a change in status. Uh, from the original brochure, uh, the purpose was to procure, arrange, and publish facts Calculate, calculated to illustrate the condition and prospects of society, the kinds of facts they were interested in were economic statistics, political statistics, medical statistics, moral and intellectual statistics. So they're all social facts in some sense. So that's what the society, the London Society, was set up to do and really, that's what it was doing. I mean, in a way, it still does that. But the, um, but the new objective, the sort of mathematical statistics objective, has sort of has overlaid that old objective. Uh, the object of the Paris Society, that's a long quote, a long extract from the speech uh, by Chevalier, which begins with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, man, know yourself. And then the way apparently you know yourself in the social sphere is to get some good economic statistics so you, knew how, you know how rich you've become or how poor you've become. And later on in the paragraph he mentions population and criminal statistics. And looking, looking at the journal on the, on the web, um, my impression is that the, the Paris Journal did these social facts pretty much as they were done in, pretty much they, as they were done in London. Uh, this, I've actually seen this table this morning. It, it's an extract from a big table in the De Poin centenary um, um, uh, paper on the Paris Society. Uh, I mean, the big thing, I, mean, I guess the big change is uh, statistical mathematics, uh, or mathematical statistics, probability theory, two, in the first 25 years and 34 in the, uh, the, the most recent 25 years. Similar changes in London in what, the, in what the, the journals and the societies were doing. Uh, there, was more, there, there, was, there was more mathematics sooner in London than in Paris. But basically, um, you could characterize the, both societies the London and the Paris ones, as where mathematical statistics was not, but they got into mathematical statistics sooner or later, well, later. Um, okay, what we're interested in, some generalizations, both the Societe and the Society were interested in information, they, they collected information, and of course the statisticians of own country uh, could get that information best. Both journals uh, carried information from and about uh, abroad. Um, there was an asymmetry, I think, always in the relationship between societies and the relationship in, in the interest in, between France and Eng England, as 19th century people would call Britain. Um, 
In 19th century Britain, France was easily, by far, the most interesting foreign country. It, French was the language that children learned in school. It was the most accessible continental country. It was, it was the country that Britain expected to go to war with. Always. I mean, it was interesting. And um, so France was interesting to Britain. In the, society, in the, the London society, uh, the Paris society was, was the only foreign society that, that counted. Just, you know, there were all these other societies, but nobody took any notice of them in London. Um, the, the London society is always bigger. Uh, I've got some numbers on the next page. It's bigger, had more people. It seemed, it seemed to be a more lively and just look, that's just looking from the looking at the journals. But in the the, the London Society only did the journal. It didn't do monographs. It just did the journal and so on. Oh, like, I mean, okay. The, the thing the thing to contrast these societies with is the American Statistical Association today, which, according to its website, has eighteen thousand members from ninety countries. In 1885, the London Society had, well, 850-ish. The Paris Society, nearly 500. They're actually like clubs. They, they were nothing like this modern society. In London, I think I've only ever noticed one foreign member, one foreign, not for 90 countries, one Frenchman, E. Dio, who joined the society. The society has a list. I mean, every time somebody joins the society, it's listed in the journal. So it's, it's a wonderfully informative uh, journal. Anyway, so there's E. Dio. He was the only uh, foreign member. It had honorary foreign members. This was a distinction imposed. On, uh, or imposed, <laughs> that's perhaps the wrong way. Or maybe it wasn't, because there was a, I think there was an interest in getting foreign members, because they would probably donate their books to the library. But anyway, the, the, the society had honorary foreign members uh, until the Second World War, at least. Um, the most popular source of these foreign members was France, and in 1838, when there was the first wave of foreign members, two out of the eight came from France. And so, um, France. Um, mostly, people in, people in London or people in the London Society read, read foreign stuff. They didn't talk to foreigners. They, they read them. Uh, by the 1870s, both the journals were publishing book reviews Everything about the London Society was on a bigger scale, so it published more book reviews. Uh, for some reason, I'm interested in, in 1911. Uh, in 1911, the Paris Journal published 20 reviews, almost all of them in French, uh, three German, one English title. Uh, the Royal Statistical Society published about 60. Uh, and you can see 14 German, 12 French, 2 Dutch, 1 Swedish, and 1 Italian. And the, uh, the London Society just did things on, on a much bigger scale. From the, 18, from, the, from the 1890s, the journal in London was publishing contents of journals, so it listed the contents of the journals. The library was receiving the Paris Journal and other journals, and so the, 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 the library in London uh, the library in London, you know, it was a big thing, um, a main function of the of the society. Uh, it, the International Institute, um, that's important for two way, in two ways. It's where English and French uh, statisticians met, and also, in, in a way, the founding of the society of the institute in 1885 was the greatest thing the society, or maybe the only thing, the society and the Societe did together. Um, first president, uh, and I'll talk about two people from that period, because they just illustrates how remote uh, that period is. The first president of the ISI, as it's called in English, 
uh, was the wonderfully named Rawson, W. Rawson, who was the president of the London Society. One of the vice presidents was Le Vasseur, uh, who had been in the uh, Paris Society. Rawson W. Rawson, Rawson was a wonderful enthusiast. He just doesn't count <coughs> the way we would count. You wouldn't, he wasn't, you wouldn't count him as a, 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 as a statistician. He was actually in the society in 1835. Then he went off to be a governor of some Caribbean islands the way Rawson W. Rawson's would have done in the 19th century. And then when he came back, retired, he spent all his time working for the London Society and the International Institute. So this person just gave all his time to this. Uh, Lovasseur is a different kind of person. Oh, he's by far the London's most esteemed uh, foreign statistician. Uh, London did wonderful obituaries, much better, I mean, much better than the Paris ones. The, the, the Lemessa even had a photograph. Nobody before Fisher had a photograph. The photograph's wonderful because of the iconography, the, the, the map, the, the, the globe, the thermometer. It's what geographers did. Uh, the, the, the later people in Britain would, have, would be sitting over calculators, but... Love us uh, anyway. Um, one thing that the, the London Society did was publish lots of things in translation. So it published all of those articles by Le Vasseur. Uh, as it happened, Le Vasseur didn't, they didn't, didn't write very much, or sorry, he didn't write very much that reached London and was translated about France. He, he wrote about everything else. So he was quite a different kind of person from uh, Rawson W. Rawson but equally remote. Uh, here's the first meeting. Uh, so, uh, in, the, in the summer of 1885, uh, there was a party in Paris, there was a party in London, celebrating his birthdays. Uh, between them, they sorted out the creation of the International Institute. Um, and it, the first meeting was in Rome in 1887. These are the people, I mean, you can see, uh, just, I mean, I suppose two things you notice, there aren't very many people. Each country provided a few people. So the only, and basically the numbers involved in these meetings was always very small. If you could read the, the names of the participants, you'd recognize, I mean, well actually, you'd recognize the French people. Uh, nobody, uh, nobody outside France would recognize the French names. Nobody outside Britain would recognize the British names. The only names that, we, that anybody would recognize, somewhere there's Lexus. So Lexus is, is easily the most famous person in mainstream history of statistics writing in that picture. Another German uh, makes it into the um, Statisticians of the Centuries volume that the ISI produced in 2000. And that's uh, von Meyer, and he makes it. Uh, he makes it, well, he's a friend of the editors, I expect, but anyway, a, a more real reason. He makes it because he's, he was a caricature of a German professor of statistics, and, and he was opposed to probability and so on. So he makes it in a way for quite opposite reasons from Lexus. Okay, um, so we've got these two societies, the Institute, going on quite happily. Uh, assembling social facts, doing this on an international scale. In London, in the 1880s, uh, Edgeworth turns up and starts doing mathematical statistics. And because, because he was a gentleman and because he wanted to be involved in the society, the society let him publish. Nobody could understand what he wrote, but he just published on and on. Edgeworth, as it was, his main, the main influence on Edgeworth was Laplace, and he was also influenced by Catelet. Uh, in Paris, uh, Lucien Marc uh, appeared in the, in the 90s. Here's some things about Edgeworth. He, he was in the society, uh, kept publishing stuff, nobody read it. Uh, his definition of statistics from 1885 was science of means. 
two kinds of science of means, specialised science of means to social statistics and general science, science of means, uh, which would be Laplace, Gauss, whoever, and the arithmetical portion of social science. Well, the arithmetical proportion of science is what the other people were doing, but and in fact what almost everybody was doing until much later. Um, <clears throat> Uh, actually, um, Edgeworth wasn't totally ignored, uh, that he had one fan in society, uh, Bowley. He joined in 1895, uh, he was quite a young bloke, uh, this is him in 1892. Um, he was primarily an economic statistician, um, he was Edgeworth's only follower in mathematical statistics, He's a big contributor to the International Institute, and he was the person who keeps going year after year after year. He was the treasurer during the interwar period, so he had a reason for going. Uh, Bowley and Edgeworth, well, there were two of them, but they didn't add up to very much as spokesmen for mathematical statistics. What was going outside the society was biometry, and you had a picture of Galton this morning uh, the person who really made a big thing of this, uh, the, you know, he built an empire, journals, courses, students, that was Carl Pearson. Uh, at the time, in the mid-1890s, he was, prof that, that, when he started doing statistics, he was professor of, of mechanics, effectively, uh, at University College London. He never joined the society, he thought they were completely hopeless of people, uh, but basically almost all his students, not all, but uh, most of his students did join the society because it was n a nice club, I mean it was n a nice place to be and they got on. It, people didn't really get on with Pearson very much. And uh, Now, of course, uh, uh, this, uh, this slide illustrates the difference in dress code of, I guess, undergraduates, so, in, so there's a Bowley, the undergraduate, from a bit of a later period. Uh, Mark, he was head of the SGF, he was active in the society. He took on some of Pearson's um, methods, and uh, amongst other things, he introduced uh, Borel to the society. Uh, Paris 189, uh, Paris 199, I, I've no idea, this was, this was Another occasion, um, and actually there's a woman in this picture, uh, which is remarkable. Uh, no, no, the people aren't identified. You perhaps can identify the place, but... Uh, um, now this was another anniversary, so this was actually, I mean, so this is actually the 50th anniversary of the society. Um, it was a, it, 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 because all these societies, because every, the society, the two societies, the institute, they had these wonderful harmon, international harmonization of birthdays. Anyway, this was a wonderful occasion. Um, there was a section on methods and mathematical statistics that Mark, uh, suggested, and believe it or not, there was, there was a serious British contingent. 25 years after the creation of the Institute, the British were getting a bit fed up with it and weren't attending very well. But this time, all the mathematical people came from London. Uh, from Paris, there was uh, Marcia and Burrell. There was Lexis, and there was this people talking about mathematical statistics in a way they wouldn't talk until way after the Second World War. Um, in the next meeting, well, well, <laughs> and, and this is just wonderful, uh, but, but it's wonderful, but it's not mathematical statistics. Um, and there was another meeting uh, in Vienna in 1913, no mathematical statistics, and so the 199 is just an outlier. The Great War. Uh, oh, I, here's um, this morning. Um, uh, um, Michel uh, talked about the uh, the French society, the Paris society, wanting of basically excluding German 
fellows. I, I, I didn't make a slide of this, but from the, this is the, the London Society from their minutes. Read a letter from the Statistical Society of Paris uh, asking what action, if any, this society will take in regard to its German fellows and honorary fellows as they would, the Parisians, would like, uh, sorry, as, as they, the Parisians, would like to act in accord with the society in this matter. The on foreign secretary, that's the person in the society who, who writes these letters, he was requested to express the desire of the society to act in harmony with the Statistical Society of Paris, but to point out the technical difficulties involved in the exclusion of honorary fellows. So in the minutes of the uh, London Society, that's the only official communication that required any kind of action. And I mean, it's wonderful. It, but anyway, the whole talk would be about that quotation, but let's put that in uh, aside. Um, JRSS um, had an obituary for Jacques Bertignon, uh, which is basically a, describes in a rather grim way what statisticians did as statisticians in the First World War. And the person who wrote the obituary visited, um, visited um, Bertignon, and that's what he was doing. He was combining lists of dead people uh, killed. In, the, in London, the, the, the library contributed its library, uh, the society contributed its library to the war effort because that had all the information on, it, on all the countries involved in the war. Um, so, there was no, nothing much going on in statistics. The 20s was a pretty dire period for British interest in France. Uh, the society, I mean, there was no reform of official statistics, just as in France. The Institute almost crashed because of the war. In the 20s, uh, Marsh and Bowley would go to meetings, talk about economic statistics, business barometers and stuff. In the 1930s, there were, things changed. And there's much more action, unfortunately, in the last six years of this relationship than in any of the previous years. On the, one, on, in, on the London side, Fisher, uh, who'd really taken over as the taken over Pearson's role as the leading person, was communicating with Fréchet Danois and Duguay. Uh, Fréchet Danois have been mentioned, so I won't say anything about them. Duguay was a, a student of Danois. That's what uh, Fréchet and Fisher looked like in the 1930s. A lot of correspondence between those two. Mostly, uh, Fréchet was trying to make sense of what Fisher was doing in statistics without really succeeding. Uh, one of, uh, of Fréchet's interests uh, in communicating with Fisher was Fréchet didn't like the use made of correlation. And he was in the International Statistical Institute, which had wonderful headed notepaper, and he wrote to Fisher uh, who was on the committee. They, so they were, there was a committee to inquire into correlation. And Fréchet and Fisher communicated. Jeannie was another person on this committee. And that was one thing. Um, they had other matters of common concern. Uh, Fréchet and Fisher both worked on order statistics. <coughs> and, and then there was gossip. Fréchet told Fisher he'd been to uh, Russia. Komogorov had said, some of this stuff that Fisher does in genetics is like what I do in <laughs> stochastic diffusion theory. Dunmar. Dunmar and Fisher, that's, that's, they, they had a different type of relationship. Uh, Dunmar began work in the 20s. In the mid-30s, there's a rather extraordinary change in the direction of Dunmar's work. He publishes this article in uh, the Common Do, uh, solving a pro an outstanding problem in Fisher's theory of inference. This is in 1935. Okay, so, so Dunmar's doing Fisherian type estimation theory in the mid-30s. Dunmar had two doctoral students who worked on Fisher topics, Duguay and Malico, 
Duguay was on, worked on the asymptotic properties of maximum likelihood. Malico worked on Fisher's um, genetical theory. Um, Duguay publishes three notes on out of his thesis in the Comron Du. He then writes to Fisher saying, here are three notes I've written. Uh, my uh, maître, uh, 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 Dalmar, suggested I write to you. And so he writes to Fisher. Fisher says, well, gosh, I'm indeed glad that you're writing about this interesting subject and you're doing it very well. Fisher then organises uh, Duguay to come to London as the Rockefeller Foundation. Duguay comes. Uh, Fisher comments to Rockefeller, who are paying the bills, uh, Duguay is an excellent mathematician, a polite and very well read boy, who's apparently never seen a computing machine, and his plates, etc. I mean, they didn't have any, they didn't have any, any calculating machines in the IHP, apparently, and of course, in his research, he never needed a calculator. So, uh, I think uh, Duguay was a kind of ambassador to London. He, he checked Fisher out to make sure he was a respectable person to invite to Paris, and uh, Fisher goes to Paris, and Darmar, of course, invites him to dinner. Uh, he gives a lecture here. Uh, the lecture was never published. Um, uh, the lecture was never published. Okay, I mean, uh, by Christmas 1938, Duguay's back in Paris, writing to Fisher saying, Happy Christmas. 1939, the IHP reorganises for war. Fisher's laboratory is evaluated, uh, evacuated from London, I think because it's occupying valuable space and they probably wanted to put the Ministry of Propaganda there. Uh, so he's moved out of London, uh, but contacts continue. Uh, this is the end of a letter from uh, Duguay. Uh, it's Duguay writing to Fisher, giving him news. Duguay's a lieutenant uh, in the army, uh, basically saying, um, one, he'd made friends with Fisher's son, George. Uh, I remember your son George is to be called up this year. Uh, I, wish, I wish him, if he is, very good luck. Happy to meet you again in better days. George was killed. Um, and but oh, but he didn't. Duguay survived. Fisher survived. Uh, when uh, at the back of the IHP, uh, back here, uh, do uh, Fresho was put in charge of this statistical laboratory. He was also point. He also had to do Darmois teaching. So for a few months in 1940, um, Fisher and Fisher and Fresho are talking about fiducial inference talking about maximum likelihood, and it's so uh, wonderful. Uh, Darmar was mobilized, and he became Captain Darmar, but he wasn't mobilized into the artillery, he was mobilized into the Anglo-French scientific mission. And he starts writing to Fisher, basically saying, what are you doing? And Fisher had to say, well, Fisher says, well, I'm not doing an awful lot. I know this, I'm, um, he, he, they talk a bit about divergent series and so on. Fisher's interested in blood groups, and blood groups, the genetics of blood groups. Dunwell was as well. That's important because of blood transfusions and expected mass casualties. Some postscripts, everybody, I mean, the principals all survived, and by August 1945, uh, they were organizing another Paris trip to Paris. A second postscript, here's a picture apparently of the backside of uh, Dalmar, who's planting a tree. So from 1955, he's president of the ISI. Fisher's the bearded man uh, looking on. These are now very important people in the ISI. So the mathematical statisticians have been captured. Uh, sorry, they've, they've captured the ISI. They've captured everything because Fisher's president of the uh, Royal Statistical Society at this time. And a final postscript, because Frechet was an honorary fellow of the society, and because he lived to be nearly a hundred, he saw everything. But actually, one thing he would never have expected 
was his obituary in the Royal Statistical Society. So this is from 1977. Uh, it, the obituary is written by David Kendall, who was the leading British probabilist of the time, which it comes as a surprise that there would be such a person. His obituary recognises that Fraser did things in statistics, but what Kendall finds amazing and overwhelming is that Fraser introduced the notion of compactness. And so Fraser's introduction of compactness in 1906 is the highlight for Kendall in his obituary in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society in 1977. Okay, that's the end. Thank you.